I'm ready when you are. All right. So, as I said, the theme of the Bible is our topic for tonight. And it's what we're going to be talking about. And many people believe and teach that Jesus Christ is the theme of the Bible. But that is simply not true. Jesus is definitely a key figure in the Bible. But he is not the theme of the Bible. If we don't understand that, the, the Bible will be confusing to us and we will miss the whole purpose that God had in writing the Bible the way that He wrote it. Because that if, if God intended for Jesus to be the theme of the Bible, He would have made Him the theme of the Bible, but He didn't. So, the Bible is the story of a king, a crown, and a throne. It starts like this. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. So we have the sovereign God creating His kingdom. So let's have a word of prayer and we'll get into this. Heavenly Father, Lord, we do love you, and we thank you for loving us. Father, I thank you for preserving your word for us the way that you have. And Father, I thank you for giving us the opportunity that we have, Lord, to get together and study your word and learn the truth of it. And Father, tonight as we look at this very, very important aspect of studying your Bible, and this aspect of the theme of the Bible. Help us, Lord, to understand it and to see it so that we can see how that you put your Bible together and how that it truly is the story of a king and a crown and a throne. And so, Father, give me the words to speak, I pray, in Jesus' name, amen. So, if you got your Bibles, go ahead and go to Job chapter 38. In Job chapter 38, we find that before God created the earth, He had created spiritual beings to inhabit His creation. Job chapter 38. Our text actually is going to start in verse 4, but I want to just start at the beginning of the chapter so that we have the context of what's going on here. Now, I'll tell you that throughout the book of Job, and Job is the oldest book in the Bible. I know you may not know that chronologically. Job is the oldest. It's the first book written. But in the book of Job, Satan and the angels, we read this this morning, Satan and his angels appeared before God to give an account for what they had been doing. And God said to Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job. So God brought Job into the story. And uh, then you know, of course, that Job lost everything that he had except his life and his wife. And uh, so then his three friends show up. I would sometimes say falsely so-called, but his three, his three friends show up and they begin to uh, basically chastise him for his sin and, and all that. It's, it's a, you have to read a book. But anyway, all through this time up from when that happened up until chapter 38, Job keeps saying, oh, if I could talk to God. Well, chapter 38, he gets his chance. And verse 1 says, Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this that darkeneth counsel by words without knowledge? Gird up now thy loins like a man, for I will demand of thee, and answer thou me. Where wast thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if thou hast understanding. Who hath laid the measures thereof, if thou knowest, or who hath stretched the line upon it? Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened, 
or who laid the cornerstone thereof. Now I want to pause right there for just a minute because there's something that I want to mention here. In verse 3, the Lord is speaking to Job. And he says, Gird up now thy loins like a man. Look at this. For I will demand of thee and answer thou me. If you're going to ask God for a tete-a-tete, -tete, you better have your answers ready. Because he is demanding that Job answer questions that Job has no way of knowing the answer to. Don't think about it. Before you go calling God into question, better have your answers ready. All right, verse seven. Verse. We'll just go with verse six. Where, whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened, or who laid the cornerstone thereof? Now, verse seven. When the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. So before God created the earth, He had His heavenly host already created. They was the cheerleaders for the creation of the earth. And if you note there, going back to this morning's lesson, it says, uh, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. So that takes it away being Seth's offspring that we talked about this morning. Just a little sidebar for your morning notes. So now, <clears throat> take your Bibles and go to Ezekiel chapter 28. Because God created the earth, Genesis 1-1, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. So He creates His creation. And all the sons of God and all the morning stars and they're singing together and they're shouting for joy because of the creation of the earth. So if you go to Genesis chapter 1 and verse 2 and it says, and the earth was without form and void and darkness is on the face of the deep, you got to know something happened between verse 1 and verse 2. And it did. Ezekiel chapter 28. Verse 11. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sum full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Now look at verse 13. Thou hast been in Eden the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering, the sardis, topaz, and the diamond, the beryl, and the onyx, and the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle, and gold. The workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou wast created. Lucifer was a created being of God's. All right. Verse 14. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created till iniquity was found in thee. By the multitude of thy merchandise, they have filled the midst of thee with violence, and thou hast sinned. Therefore, I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God, and I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty, Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings that they may behold thee. 
Thou hast defiled my sanctuaries by the multitude of thine iniquities, by the iniquity of thy traffic. Therefore will I bring forth a fire from the midst of thee, it shall devour thee, and I will bring thee to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all them that behold thee. So God had an established hierarchy of government in His kingdom. When God created the heaven and the earth, Lucifer, the anointed cherub that covereth, had his throne on the mountain of God and Eden, the garden of God. He was either number two or number four, depending on how you look at the Godhead, over the whole creation that God had created. I look at it personally. <clears throat> you have God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, and then Lucifer. You could look at it as you had God in His entirety as one, and then Lucifer. Either way, he was the guy that was actually in charge of everything. He was beautiful. His light lighted everything. All of those stones that it talks about, his light emanated through that, out through the universe. He's beautiful. He was also the song leader. He had the pipes and the tabrais. That, quite frankly, is why there's so much problems with song leaders in churches. That's his domain, originally. So God had his established hierarchy, and there was a problem in the kingdom. Because the number two guy wanted to be numero uno. He wanted to be the number one guy. He was the guy in the leadership that was not satisfied with his position and brought about a rebellion. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 14. Verse 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? And how art thou cut down to the ground, which did weaken nations, the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Lucifer had a big eye problem. A big eye problem. I will, I will, I will, I will. And God says, you will not. So we see here that Lucifer was not satisfied with being over all of God's creation. He wanted to exalt his throne above the throne of God. The creation wanted to become more powerful 
than the Creator. As we see in Ezekiel chapter 28, that came from pride because he was so beautiful, because he had such a beautiful voice, because he was thought, thought he was all of that and the bag of chips. So he was going to exalt his throne. So the Bible is the story of the struggle of a king and his kingdom. Let's go back to the book of Job. Job chapter 9. I didn't have this one in my notes, so I wanted to make sure I was right. Job chapter 9. Verse 1. Then Job answered and said, I know it is so of truth, but how should man be just with God? It, look at verse 3. If he will contend with him, he cannot answer him one of a thousand. He was about to learn that later on. Anyway, verse 4. He is wise in heart and mighty in strength, who hath hardened himself against him, and, excuse me, and hath prospered. Watch this now, verse 5. Which removeth the mountains, and they know not which overturneth them in his anger, which shaketh the earth out of her place, and the pillars thereof tremble, which commanded the sun, and it riseth not, and sealeth up the stars, which alone spreadeth out the heavens, and treadeth upon the waves of the sea. When Satan decided... Lucifer decided that he was going to become Satan and he was going to exalt his throne above the throne of God. War broke out in heaven. We talked about that this morning. Revelation chapter 12, verses 7 through 9. Satan and his angels go to war against God and his angels. We just see here in Job chapter 9 when that happened. The earth was shaken out of its place. When God created the earth, the earth was at the top of the universe. The same place it's going to be in Revelation chapter 21 with the new heaven and the new earth. When the war broke out, the earth was shaken off its axis. Now the Bible says, Heaven is my throne. The earth is my footstool. It used to be at the top of the universe. It's now at the bottom. That's why, go back to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. We just read that in Job chapter 9. The reason for that is because of Lucifer's rebellion. When God created the heaven and the earth, it was perfect. The book of Colossians, we talked about this when we was going through it. The book of Colossians very clearly lays out that Jesus Christ is the creator. And Jesus Christ created everything that he created after the perfect pattern of the Godhead. Everything in the universe is a system of threes. Because that is perfect. Now 
I'm just saying. God didn't create a heaven and an earth that was darkness without form and void and have all of his angelic host celebrating the occasion. No. Look at verse 3. And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. We just read that in Job 9. And God saw the light, that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. All right. So now we separated light and darkness. Verse 6. And God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. Now, I want to show of hands. How many of you have heard somebody say that that firmament was earth? Stay with me then, because you need to learn the truth. And God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the water, which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. Look at this. And God called the firmament heaven. And the evening and the morning were the second day. So here's what happened. You have the war in heaven that we read about in Job chapter 9 and the earth is shaking off its axis and God opens, we didn't go all the way through it, but God opened the floodgates of heaven and, and He just filled the universe with water. Now, I know I'm going to get chastised for this, but I'm going to tell you anyway and then we'll get into it later on and, and, and I'll show you what I'm talking about. From Genesis chapter 1 and verse 2 up until... Uh, verse 21 we're not talking about the original creation we're talking about regeneration there's no creation the word create doesn't show up after verse 1 until verse 21 everything else is God regenerating it's the doctrine of regeneration it's just like you what happened to you God regenerated you, right? You was dead in your trespasses and sins, and God regenerated you. He did the same thing with the whole universe. So this firmament is heaven. It's what I would refer to as the second heaven. It's where the stars are. We'll get into that. Okay, verse 9. And God said, Let the waters under the heaven be gathered together unto one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters called he seas, and God saw that it was good. Now you got the earth. Well, wait a minute. He created it back in verse 1. You see what I'm saying? He didn't create it here. He regenerated it here. He, he brought it back to life. And God said, Let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself, upon the earth. And it was so. And the earth brought forth grass and herb yielding seed, after his kind and the tree yielding fruit whose seed was in itself after his kind and God saw that it was good and the evening and the morning were the third day verse 14 and God said let there be lights in the firmament of heaven and divided the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons for days and for years and let them be for lights in the firmament of heaven to give light upon the earth and it was so and God made two great lights the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. And God set them in the firmament of heaven to give light upon the earth 
and to rule over the day and over the night and to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And the evening and the morning were the fourth day. God had a kingdom. Somebody by the name of Lucifer tried to overthrow his kingdom. War broke out. The whole universe was involved. You have to understand the power of the angelic beings is far greater than any power that you and I can even imagine. It was a it was a war of great magnitude that moved the earth and God flooded the earth. That was the first flood. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. So God created man and he gave him dominion over everything. Now watch this. Stay with me. I'm going someplace here. You just didn't know. It. Genesis chapter 2 verse 7 And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. Look at verse 8. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. All right. Remember Ezekiel chapter 28? Who had their throne in Eden, the garden of God? Lucifer. Now, God creates man in his image and his likeness. When Adam was created, he was sinless and perfect. He is the first Adam. The Bible says Jesus is the second Adam. Or the last Adam is actually what it says. Luke chapter 3 and verse 38 says that Adam was the son of, I mean, yeah, Adam was the son of God. So he creates this man, Adam, and he puts him, gives him dominion over everything and puts him in the same spot that Lucifer had had his throne. And guess who shows up? on day one. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 1. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, He shall not eat of every tree of the garden. Satan shows up. And what happened? Man falls. Man falls. 
the rest of the Bible is a repeat of God putting a man in a position to be over his kingdom. And every time man fails. Every time. It goes all the way through the nation of Israel from first through the life of Noah, even all, all the way back there. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. So the Lord preserves Noah and his family. They get on the, they get on the ark. They survive the next flood, the second flood. They survive that. They get off of the... Turn to Genesis chapter 9. Genesis chapter 9 and verse 1. And God blessed Noah and his sons and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. Does that sound familiar? And the fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth and upon every fowl of the air, upon all that moveth upon the earth and upon all the fishes of the sea. Into your hand are they delivered. Same thing. So now God has, <clears throat> has cleaned things up again. He's flooded it out again. The waters have receded. Noah and the boys and, and, and their wives get off the boat. And God tells them this. Be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth. Verse 20, Genesis chapter 9. And Noah began to be a husbandman. And he planted a vineyard. And he drank of the wine. And was drunken. And he was uncovered within his tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brethren without. So what happens? Noah gets off the boat. He's got all of his vegetation that he saved what's he do he goes and plants some grapes so he can have him some wine and he gets drunk and it goes downhill from there so we go from that to Abraham and his descendants what a mess they was every type of abomination that you can think of. And then we get into the kings like we were talking about this morning. You get two bad kings, one good king. One king that's good and bad. Solomon. And it goes all the way through. God trying to establish His kingdom here on earth. Now, don't misunderstand me. God knows exactly how this thing is going to play out. That's why we can read it today and we can see exactly how it plays out. He already knew. But that's what the Bible is all about. It's the story of a king, a crown, and a throne. So we have it going through from the forming of the nation of Israel up through Moses and Joshua. Then the judges. That was a mess. And then the kings. I said that was a mess. All the way up to the captivity of the nation. All this time, God is moving. Satan is moving in opposition. God, it's like a game of chess. God moves. Satan moves in opposition. It goes on and on throughout the history of the whole universe. Even before man. It started with Satan. The one thing that you definitely want to keep in mind is that God through it all is and has always been in charge Satan can only do what God allows him to do
That is really important for you and I to understand because a lot of times we'll do something and we'll pull out the old Flip Wilson routine. Devil made me do it. No. 99.9% .9 of the time, your flesh and my flesh made us do it. Satan is not going to waste a scud missile on a mosquito. He's got better things to do. He's got people of power and prominence to mess with. He doesn't need to mess with us. We do a yeoman's job on our own. Let's go to Genesis chapter 20. I'm sorry, Revelation chapter 20. I said Genesis and went to the back of the Bible. Revelation chapter 20. In Revelation chapter 20, beginning in verse 1, it says, And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit, and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years, and cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him, that he should deceive the nations no more, till the thousand years should be fulfilled, and after that he was loosed a little season. So what we have going on here is the millennial reign of Christ. We have came back with, with Christ in, in chapter 19 and have squashed the rebellion here on earth. And Jesus has set up his throne in Jerusalem. Satan is bound for a thousand years in the bottomless pit. When that thousand years is up, Here's what happens, verse 7. And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of the prison, out of his prison, and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them now look at verse 10 and the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever and I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. And death and hell were delivered up. Delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, every man, according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. There's something that I want to make note of here. Verse 11 says, And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. I want you to understand something about the great white throne judgment. The whole world, every human, and the angels are going to be standing before God held in place 
by the power of God. They're not going to be standing on anything. The heaven and the earth has fled away. These people that have rejected Jesus Christ, that have rejected God from the beginning, all the way back to the angels that went with Satan to try to overthrow God, are going to stand before the great white throne of God, being held there by the power of God. And when they come up short, they're going to be cast into the lake of fire for eternity. When the Bible tells us that we shouldn't argue amongst ourselves and we couldn't, shouldn't fight amongst ourselves, we should make decisions amongst ourselves because we're going to be judging angels, it's right there. We're on God's side at the great white throne judgment. Here's the sad thing. We're going to be standing there surrounding the throne of God and we're going to see people that we know, people that we've talked to, people that we have said we loved get cast into the lake of fire and we're going to know Oh, this hurts. But we're going to know we should have told them about Jesus. At that point, it's too late. But the king is on his throne. Chapter 21, verse 1. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away and there was no more sea. There's nothing to keep us out of heaven now. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, come down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of the heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and He will dwell with them, and they shall be His people, and God Himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. Look at this. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. All things are new. He's still on the throne. Now, now he has his kingdom. It's perfect. It's perfect. There's no more sin. There's no more war. There's no more death. There's no more sorrow. The king has his throne and his crown and his kingdom. That, my friends, is the theme of the Bible. Not Jesus. Oh, oh, he's very important. But he is not the theme. The kingdom, the throne, and the crown are the theme. Is the theme, however you want to put it. It's what the Bible is all about. In the end, in the end, God is seated on his throne. Satan is burning in hell. And eternity is perfect. That's what we have to look forward to. I'd like to have every head bowed, every eye closed, no one looking around. What we've seen tonight and talked about tonight 
has been the theme of the Bible. I've tried to make it as clear and as understandable as I possibly can in the time allotted. The key thing that I want you to take away from here is this. The king is on his throne and he always has been. And he always will be. Since the fall of Lucifer, there has been a war, a battle, to try to put the king off of the throne. One of these days, in the not too distant future, it's all going to come to an end. For you and I, it'll be quicker than the end of the story. We have two options that we face. If you're here in the, in the building or if you happen to be watching this on the video, we have two options. See, it's not a matter of if we're going to live for eternity, we are. It's a matter of where we're going to live for eternity. As believers in Jesus Christ, we will live with Him in heaven. In fact, the Bible tells us that we will be living in the New Jerusalem, in the God's holy city. But those who reject God those who reject Jesus Christ have their permanent home as well. It's called the lake teeming with fire and brimstone. It's the only two choices there are. If you're hearing this message and you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, I... I'm not going to get on my knees and beg you, but I'm almost there. Please, call on Him. The Bible tells us in Romans chapter 10, it says uh, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised Him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. It says, for with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, or with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. If you're hearing this message, I don't care if you're here in the house or if you're hearing it on the video or however, and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, now's the time to fix that. You don't know, and I don't know, when we will take our last breath, when we will have our last heartbeat. But when that happens, your decision has been sealed. So if you don't know Jesus Christ, right now is your chance. It's, it's very simple. We talked about it this morning in church, the simplicity that's in Christ. Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. He was buried and He rose again the third day according to the Scripture. It's a scriptural fact. It's a documented historical fact. Jesus Christ died for sinners such as I. And we just read the verses in Romans. If you call on Him, if you confess your sin, He is faithful and just to forgive you your sin and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. That goes for a saved person as well as a lost. 1 John 1, nine. But Romans says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, shall be saved. Now is your time to call on Him. It's real simple. It's real simple. Man. All you have to do is say, God, I know I'm a sinner. I confess that you're right and I'm wrong. I believe that you died for my sin. I believe that you was buried and that you rose again the third day. I want to be in your family. I want to be saved.
It's that simple. You don't have to use those exact words. You can use whatever words you want to use. If you just confess that God is right and you're wrong. And you want him to be your savior. Christians, we have an awesome responsibility. We have seen the kingdom tonight from the beginning to the end. There's a lot of people that we know and people that we will meet that don't know Jesus Christ as their Savior. Their end is the lake of fire for eternity. I don't want to be standing there beside my Lord watching people that I know, people that I love, be cast into the lake of fire because I didn't tell them. If I tell them and they reject it, that's on them. If I don't tell them, it's on me. And I want you to remember that God wipes away all the tears after the great white throne judgment because we're going to have some there. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we love you. Father, we thank you for loving us. Father, I thank you for the Bible. I thank you for the truth that is in it. Lord, I, I thank you for the understanding that you give us, for the responsibility that we have as believers in Jesus Christ. And Father, I pray that as, as we ponder on what we've looked at here tonight about the theme of the Bible and it being the kingdom, and Father, how that, that you are, are not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. You are the king of the kingdom, and you want the kingdom to be as large as it can be. Father, help us that know this to tell others who don't. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.